Hello, everyone. My name is Frank Ruder, and I am here with my colleague and friend Aaron Hamza, and we're both very happy to welcome you to this new episode of the Crisis and Critique podcast under the title Philosophy and its Other Scene, today with a very special guest whom I'm about to introduce in a minute. But before that, let me quickly say that our next episode will be with Cornel West, who's currently a presidential candidate in the race. I mean, hopefully we won't. Um, in the race um, um, in uh, 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 the US. And it, it, this will be recorded in January. If you like the work that we're doing here, we would be grateful if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our Spotify channel or become a patron and support us. We would massively appreciate that. Today is very special for us because we have with us a very, very special guest, namely our friend. And if we, if I might dare, master, uh, namely Slavoj Zizek. Even though it itself became a sort of cliche that one cannot introduce Slavoj Zizek because he needs no introduction or any introduction that one uses and attempts to be entertaining and funny or original will fall short of the wit and pointedness of the man himself, the man one tries to introduce, knowing very well of these deadlocks and having failed at introducing Slavoj several times before, I will try to fail better, but very briefly. I just want to mention very few things. It is clear and without any question that Slavoj is one of the, if not the most important living Hegelian philosopher, one of the, if not the most important Lacanian theorist, and one of the, if not the most relevant communist thinker of our times. He's a senior researcher of the, at the University of Ljubljana, international director at the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities in London, and guest professor at several universities on this planet. The most recent extensions of his majestic and gigantic oeuvre are too late to awaken what lies ahead when there is no future from Ellen Lane this year, freedom a disease without cure from Bloomsbury also this year, and about to come out is Christian atheism, how to be a real materialist um, also with Bloomsbury. Slav Slavoj, thank you so much for being us with us today. Um, we really are looking forward uh, to this uh, conversation. It's my honor to be here, and just let me add something I didn't know about Cornel West. This is a beautiful coincidence because I plan a short trip to the United States in April to make propaganda for, I really write too much, for my next book, which will appear at the beginning of April, Christian Atheism. And it, since uh, Cornell is also some kind of theologist and politically way to the left, uh, I'm glad he already also accepted and glad to announce that we will have somewhere in New York a big, big public debate. Wonderful. Good to hear that. Um, oh, that's, okay. that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Slavoj, it's, uh, it's truly a great honor to, uh, to have you here. So. Uh, let us begin with uh, with your latest uh, publications that Frank uh, just uh, mentioned, namely the Freedom Book and the uh, Too Late to Be Awakened. The first one uh, seemed to be uh, more of a philosophical treatise, while uh, the second book is more of an uh, inter uh, intervention in the political uh, conjuncture. So to, to start with the Freedom Book, you divide it into two parts, uh, freedom as such and human uh, freedom. The latter deals with the mess and dilemmas of our social lives in which we are at the same time free and not free in many uh, different uh, ways. The, the former, however, appears to be more complicated as it deals with freedom on its own grounds, uh, as it were. But it should be noted that it does not stand for the abstract uh, uh, formal structure of freedom. It also stands for concrete social situations in which this abstraction is directly realized in what cannot but appear as an excess that violates all particular uh, rules. So our first question is, how can we attain any insight or concept of freedom as such? How does such an abstraction uh, materially manifest? And are we here not to immediately confront an immense political issue, notably the question, if it, if it is a concept of freedom, a concept worth fighting for no matter what? Has it not, for example, at least up to a certain extent, uh, and in certain contexts, has been appropriated by the far right uh, ideologist or politics. I discerned in what you just said three mega questions, each of them 
deserves at least half an hour answer. <laughs> I will not do this, but uh, I will try at least to give a hint at what I'm saying. I would like to begin at the end. I'm sorry if I'll be junk it a little bit up and down. Uh, the question is a concept of freedom, a concept worth fighting for. I think that what we are witnessing today is not a fight about freedom in the sense of for freedom or against freedom, but the fight between different dimensions of the notion of freedom itself. For example, on one extreme, he is so crazy that I almost like him, Milei, the new Argentinian president, who defines himself as anarcho-capitalist, he will, I think, not be able to fulfill his program, but to actualize his program. But it's interesting when he was asked what to do in Argentina against to fight poverty, he, and this is for me, a consequent liberalism, at least a certain dimension of it. He, as most of us probably know, he proposed to not only legalize, but even solicit that parents, adults can legally uh, uh, sell their organs, like if somebody needs my kidney or whatever, and their children. Now, in an abstract sense, you can say, yes, this is an important extension of the notion of freedom. You can even trade freely dispose of this. But it's uh, uh, problematic, of course, but it gives an important insight. You know, there are, as I write in my freedom book, there are, I evoke there and as I love Mozart and Wagner, uh, I always think about the finale of Act One of Don Giovanni, where the guests arrive to a party organized by Don Giovanni, and then first Don Giovanni and then all others start to think Eviva la Libertà. It's really like going on for almost half a minute, but it is absolutely clear that each group means another thing by freedom. Now, I'm not simply saying in a primitive pseudo-Marxist way uh, that uh, nonetheless there is an essential core or that we should of the freedom or that we should make a plus analysis and distinguish different dimensions. No, practically always when people are united fighting for freedom, if you look at it closely, there are different dimensions in it. I remember a pathetic example. I'm not proud of me today for participating in it. Over 30 years ago, when Slovenia, my country, was moving towards independence, the notion was always also freedom, freedom. But it was so clear that, for example, for some people, old right-wingers, freedom means we want to get back what was nationalized, what was taken from us. For uh, religious people, freedom meant full freedom of religion, which, of course, for them meant full access to the church, of the, of the Catholic Church, uh, uh, to public media, and so on and so on. There were some trade union leftists for whom freedom meant more workers' rights. There were gay people. L okay, at that time, they were not called LGBT+, plus, but all these, let's call them sexual minorities. They wanted their freedom. Uh, and of course, at that moment, nobody was attentive to how incompatible these notions of freedom were. So the first thing is that uh, 
We should be here Leninist, you know, the infamous Lenin phrase, freedom of whom, freedom to do what. This is more important than ever today. Uh, so I don't think this is something that we can then uh, uh, in a primitive way dispel by introducing a distinction of authentic true freedom and false freedom and so on. The notion of freedom is in itself inconsistent. This is why now comes the first provocation. This is why I don't know how this was meant, Agon, in your question. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a concept of freedom worth fighting for no matter what? I'm not only saying in the standard Marxist way, no, because bourgeois freedoms can be tools of oppression. I'm even saying quite concretely that quite often, even if a people is fighting for freedom, what they actually, although maybe not clear in their mind, want is even more oppression than in the existing regime. So to go to the end to provoke you, I can well imagine have dictatorial, dictatorial military intervention, which are necessary to protect freedom. It's another question, are they enough? To give you two examples that I always like to mention. You remember some 15 years ago or 20, there were so-called free elections in Algeria. And later in Egypt, when was it, 10 years ago, part of the Arab Spring. What happened there? The active minority, mostly uh, middle-class, educated young people, organized vast demonstrations for freedom. Okay, then they got free elections. They didn't win. Muslim fundamentalists won. And the result was that the army, with a grudging ap approval of the very people who started, who began protests, accepted that nonetheless the army rule is better. Also, we should be here absolutely against any uh, uh, taboos. For example, yes, we all would like Palestinians to have freedom, but let me make, and my support for Palestine is well known, so I will hope I will not be misunderstood. But let me imagine that somehow, I don't know why, they would conclude a weird peace day Gaza and Israel, Israel with Druze, and Gaza becomes a democratic state, not in any deep Western sense, but in the sense that people really elect, maybe not formally, but kind of the type of government they want. Do we really think that this will be a government which would fit our Western notions of freedom. Probably a lot of oppression of women will remain and so on and so on and so on. I more and more, I am skeptical about the idea that, how to put it, basically when they are not manipulated, people, majority of ordinary people, know what they want and that this is an authentic demand for freedom. What if it is not? I'm skeptical about this. That's why to go absolutely to the end, I like this. Uh, I already spoke with some of my leftist friends in the United States and we envisage, envisage the following possibility. Let us say, you never know, but in this madness that we have now, that Trump wins next elections. And let's say that he will not be more gentrified, tamed, but that he 
will continue his march towards uh, total radical change in American political system. Do you know that there are already leftists in the United States who count on the army intervention here? Because they remember something that I also noticed. Remember the 6th of January, when it was almost three years ago. But do you know which was? Today, people don't like to hear this. When the dream of the leftists was appropriated by the new populist right and what every leftist is, has wet dreams about the people penetrating the very seat of power when it happened. You know that the army, the top of the army, said clearly that they will not tolerate such subversion of the public order. They said this discreetly, but clearly. There is a long history, again, of democratic military coups. And I have no problems here. There is, again, back to my Leninist point, there is no abstract rule here. There are situations, yes, as we then we know what happened later, but there are situations like Syriza in Greece, where vote, public vote really means something. Here I slightly disagree with otherwise our good friend Alain Badiou, who has this, how should I call it, absolute distrust of vote. No, but I also don't think that free voting is, should be fetishized. Don't we feel this we, if you have a spontaneous leftist sense that there are situations, you feel it in the air, where election matters, where it is very important who wins. Then, but this is an exception. I agree this. Then another pessimist point of mine, which I repeat also in the book, this is horrible, but except in exceptional situations, I don't think that the majority of the people really want freedom. If by freedom, you mean we have a big dilemma, we have now to decide. No, and I understand people. I'm as a rule among them. I want to get a clear indication from orientation, which is close to me, what is to be done. I don't want to do it myself. I want to be, to be cynical, I want to be told this is the right thing to do. I want my freedom in normal, peaceful political state to be a formality. I decide, but only formally. We should be against, very clear in these things. Uh, but on the top of all this, I think that if, and here, but you himself oscillates. For some time, he said something which I quoted often, some 10 years ago, that the biggest threat today to emancipatory movement is not capitalism, exploitation, fascism, it's democracy. Now, this may sound extreme in this abstract forum, I don't agree, but he made a point because when a situation is really tense, then a democracy, a trust in democracy can be the main obstacle to emancipation, because it has this pacifying effect. Listen, we can do it peacefully. We don't need really to fight. You trust the existing uh, mechanisms to, uh, too much. So that's also why my book, Freedom, doesn't do too well. No, it's selling well, but it doesn't find the echo. You know why? Because both of you, if you were, you, uh, uh, Agon and Frank, if you were stupid enough to read it at least a little bit, you notice that it's a dark book, you know, there is a very good book 
on, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but it's not the type of spy scheme. It's my old age senility. You know, uh, the guy who wrote a book, The Dark Deleuze. Yeah, and brought out how Deleuze is not this uh, happy agon. It's good that you brought a drink. I thought that you totally control my mind and you will show uh, that book. <laughs> no, what I want to say is that he brought out the other side where Deleuze is not this happy multiplicity, you know. Just the, no, there is an extremely dark aspect of Deleuze. I think the same holds for freedom. Freedom should not be, sorry for using this stupid jargonistic term, the master signifier. Freedom is, as Alain, but you would have said, freedom today especially is not a sign which, uh, sorry, a concept which allows us to draw the crucial right distinction. No, freedom is a term which is in itself, it only designates a certain terrain of the battle. It's absolutely crucial. Let me now just briefly show where I see the basic tension in this notion. I will not even lose the time with populists, although, again, the first task of a true leftist today <clears throat> is to not follow to the end the liberal democratic blackmail, which is forget about your socialist dreams today. Uh, the big struggle is us against populist or other fundamentalists. No, while of course we should make tactical alliances with liberals, when we are fighting for uh, women's rights, LGBT or whatever, also, of course, all other things, free education, healthcare and so on, we should never forget that the new right-wing populism is a secondary phenomenon. It's a sign, a symptom of something going wrong, in the basic liberal democratic project itself. The, this, if we don't bear in mind this, we've sold our souls uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the devil. Now, uh, as for the notion of freedom, now I'm slowly returning up to the more philosophical core of your question. Uh, I was well aware of the risk of opposing freedom as such, which in some sense means not in a human sense, not, sorry, freedom as a term of humanity, but even an anti-humanist freedom, radical self-destructive freedom and uh, concrete freedom. Uh, first, now I will follow my socialist line, although it's not enough today, I claim. You know, uh, what we who still want to be radical left should emphasize again and again is something that even many honest conservatives know today. To be free, it's possible only to be free in the sense of concrete freedom in everyday life. This is possible only within a well-defined set of social rules, written, very important and unwritten rules, even good manners. And don't tell me that I am naive with the notion of good manners. I'm more and more turning into a Leninist philosopher of manners, good manners. Now you will laugh, but remember so-called Lenin's testament when he um, criticized this guy, that guy, and then the orgasmic moment is Stalin, no? But what is his argument against Stalin? Not any political line, Stalin is too right-wing, too radical, no. It's, read it, 
it's Stalin doesn't have good manners. He is too brutal and so on. But what I want to say again is that uh, uh, this is what socialists to claim today. The point is not in this Stalinist way to emphasize how bourgeois freedom is only abstract freedom in the sense of, in principle, you are free, but in actuality, you are exploited. Uh, we should respect these liberal freedoms. We should just add something, which is we should fight for concrete circumstances, laws, social manners, financial support, which enable people to actually enjoy these freedoms. For example, uh, general health care for liberals, conservative liberals. This was, I don't like too much Obama, but he did try something great, which was already too much for the United States, Obamacare. You remember why? Okay, he half succeeded, then it was abolished by Trump. The basic conservative idea was this limits our freedom. The state will, uh, the state will uh, prescribe to you, you should take this doctor, you will lose your freedom there. Now this, here I'm on the side of Obama. Obama didn't issue, limit your freedom. If you, had ma if you had money, you can still go to a better private doctor. But isn't it that we should all feel this, that today with all these new diseases, viruses, cancer, whatever, so cancer is not new, but all the diseases we are obsessed with, uh, isn't it that it contributes immensely to your sense of freedom if you don't have to think about this all the time. I'm not a nostalgic of old socialism, but one thing I remember fondly, and hundreds of thousands in Slovenia do, that uh, you were afraid to get cancer or whatever. But could, you could rely on it that if I get it, there is a state finance healthcare which will, within the scope of what is possible, take care of it. You know how immensely liberating was this? How much more freedom did it give to you? The same is with free education. Liberals say, yes, you should be free to realize your potentials and so on. Yes, but without free education, this is meaningless. You need this, you know. So, and especially, but I don't have time to go into it now, I must emphasize unwritten rules of freedom, especially today when very few, although now things are turning dark, very few people uh, would be openly, directly racist. Racism, sexism, and so on survive at the level of unwritten rules, everyday practices, and so on and so on. There is where our fights should be, uh, our fights uh, should be left. So this is one thing, but nonetheless, there are positions, moments, and I think we are approaching such a moment where a more radical measures will be necessary, where it's not enough just to say, respect freedoms, give them a socialist twist, and so on. But where, and it's here, this is happening in the United States now, of all countries, where the basic social edifice, the social pact, which maintains a society, is disintegrating. So we are approaching a moment where a certain dose of abstract freedom, ra more radical freedom, will be necessary. By abstract freedom, I mean you no longer 
in your free activity, you no longer can rely on the existing set of social laws, rules, manners. You can lose... I come in there? Can I, can I come in there? Uh, I mean, with the <clears throat> just because you propose in freedom exactly thereby to re uh, reposition what 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 we mean by communism. That is. You you explicitly say um, perhaps the time has come to reconceive communism as a counter revolution as an effort to establish a new stable order. Mm -hmm. And if we understand this correctly, I mean the background of that point is that capitalism is a a social organization or form of social organization that that perpetually self revolutionizes itself, but not always in a good way, right? Also in, in very yeah, catastrophic yeah. ways. Yeah. And, and and hence the moment we try to let's say what what we're confronted with to revolutionize it again we're strangely seem to be confronted with the paradox that by opposing this self revolutionizing tendency by means of a revolution we end up unwillingly reproduce uh, what we try to overcome i mean somehow your your critique i think of 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 china or contemporary china at least some some versions of it uh, might might exactly point uh, in that direction so the 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 true way you seem to be saying to revolutionize that permanent revolutionizing is to counter revolutionize means to propose a new form of stability a new form of social order a new form of let's say social social bond so to speak um um and and, and so we were wondering would you say would you say that this is still um Marx's old line right I mean as as you know uh, no uh, I admit it, I'm a Hegelian here no yeah no, so, sorry. So I, what right, I mean, no, in the sense that that that, that please, Marx please. Marx has this idea, right, that the French Revolution brings um, into the world an incomplete revolution and thereby continues endlessly yeah. uh, in in a badly infinite way. And he thought one has to complete the revolution. You seem to reshift and refocus things, right? Um, um, so it's not simply a different spin on 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 Marx's idea, but you seem to be proposing something else. So a let's say emancipatory counter revolution, if I if 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 I may. Term, I will use it. I will tell you why. Because uh, you know the problem when you get this abstract freedom, which means a moment when the legal order vacillates, when and so on, and so on is uh, and again, so that you will not accuse me of being a neo-fascist leftist. You know who gave me this idea? You will not believe me. Alain Badiou, we debated once cultural revolution, and he told me, when I told him, but nonetheless, then Mao ordered the attack on Shanghai Commune and so on. And uh, he said, yes, this ecstatic moment, exactly, as I would say, of abstract freedom, has to be stopped at a certain level. And the point is, I, this is again my dark communism or dark freedom. Who will do it? Will we leave it to the enemies to do it? Or will we, the revolutionary, gather the courage to do it? Uh, that's why, now I will evoke an example, which may sound strange because Robespierre and Sanjit are usually dismissed as the madmen who wanted to go on and on. No, I read recently a couple of excellent new biographies of Robespierre, who showed that uh, when in the spring of 94, uh, not Valmy, Valmy was, uh, sorry, of, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, 1794, a revolution won with the big defeat of the English and others in the north, in Dutch territory. At that point, the, uh, the homeland France was saved. And from that point on, the big worry of Robespierre was stop, how to stop the terror, not allowing the counter revolution to do it. And he did desperate things. He got in fight with the majority of Jacobins and so on. He saw clearly that if Jacobins don't do it to introduce a new relatively stable order, then 
the opponent will do it. Uh, Gironde and so on. And he was desperately looking for allies here, there, and so on. And it was too late. And again, here comes the true greatness. He saw clearly that history is moving towards a new dictatorship emperor. And he said, no, it's better for us to lose our heads than to do this. And I think that one of his last speeches, when he was already losing in convent, it's ear breaking, it, it, where he said, I am well aware that very soon I will lose my head. These are my last words, and so on, and so on. So uh, uh, you, Frank, once also mentioned this, when you said, we need strong leader, and then when the situation is stabilized, maybe it's a good idea to cut off the head of this leader. You mentioned, you know. So my idea is a crazy one. But this was the problem of Soviet Union, that they were not able to do it after the victory in the civil war. You know, by counter revolution, how to do a proper counter revolution, a counter revolution on our terms. By counter revolution, I don't mean, oh, the bad guys are back in power. I mean, a new daily, a new form of peaceful daily life. That's the true uh, measure. And again, if you don't do it, he saw it clearly, Robespierre. Then you get Napoleon, war, and so on. It goes to the great honor of Robespierre that he was always opposed to exporting revolutions. Why? As some, I think even Francois Furet, who is otherwise critical, praise, praises Marx, who said that Napoleon's formula was since revolution was no longer going in France, export it, change it into military conquest, export it all, uh, export it all around. So in this sense, what I miss in Marx is that this logic of permanent self-revolutionizing, Marx, at least following his standard statement, want it to go on even in communism. Sometimes Marx writes as if good thing about bourgeoisie is this contact self-revolutionizing. Unfortunately, capitalist form uh, uh, of production, relations of production are a limit to it. So let's cut this off to get this constant self-revolutionizing even in an even more uh, radical form. That's for me, the problem with Marx, if you ask me, that uh, for him, I will put it now, as I developed already in my books, I will put it now in very clear form that Marx's idea of communism was still capitalism without capitalism. That is to say, this immense capitalist dynamic, but without of course, capitalist relations of production and so on and so on. And uh, you know where I see in a more apolitical than political sphere, some hope for this today. Some countries like Japan, and I'm not talking here about political talk, but ordinary people. In Japan, they did, I learned this from Kohei Saito, the eco-Marxist, in the last 10, 15 years, there is a silent opinion, like nobody puts it publicly, or at least not too much, that, wait a minute, we have some kind of a relatively good standard. Why go on with new and new? Why don't we learn just to, not in a decadent sense, but small pleasures of life, culture, writing, in a more peaceful way to enjoy life. It's also ecologically better and so on and so on. This tiredness of constant emergency state of constant progress. So this idea, I must say, uh, uh, this idea uh, uh, fascinates me. But uh, before we go on, let me just finish this point 
that, that crucial for me, the first one, freedom, crucial is for me, the beautiful quote from Sartre that I list in my book, when Sartre wrote that under German occupation, we were totally under control, no concrete freedom, but we were more free than ever. Why? Because again, there was there was order, but it was not our own order. So we have we were more abstractly free. We have to do it. And here, if you permit me to ask myself a question, no, here we really touch the problem of uh, uh, what is freedom, basically. In what sense? Agon, in your part of the question, you say something wonderful. How can we attain any insight or concept of freedom as such? Yes, that's for me the point. As you, Agon, put it in a very Hegelian way, abstract freedom is not something in the air as opposed to concrete forms. There are forms of, uh, of bad and good, social revolutions, but also public disorder, Carnivalist orgies, where abstract freedom becomes empirically testable or reality, reality that we can, for a brief moment, experience. And uh, but uh, if you permit me, I would like uh, permit me another detour. This is for me crucial, very important. Now we cover the nonetheless social aspect of freedom. But the second chapter of my book, which is for me, sorry for this term, metaphysically the crucial, is a much more naive question. It is, but are we basically free or not? I go here into the topic usually covered by cognitive sciences, brain sciences, and so on and so on. And <clears throat> I reject the usual compatibilist version, which is basically for me too cynical. According to this version, it doesn't matter what freedom is metaphysically. Are we really free or are all our acts determined by, by not unconscious, because unconsciousness is a psychic phenomenon, by neuronal processes and so on, the standard answer is the one by Daniel Dennett, who says, listen, of course, we all want to feel free to do what we want, what we desire, and so on. But it's a totally different question. Are we, when we feel free and so on, are we effectively free, or is this still part of the global natural determinism? What I'm really fighting for is this question. What, why? Now, you, I don't agree with Dennett and others, whom I otherwise appreciate, that this is irrelevant. I think that the horror, potential horror, of today's technological developments, which are, of course, embedded in logic of capitalist reproduction, is that this metaphysical dimension, are we free or not, is directly intervening into our reality. Not only publicity, but different forms of now uh, uh, wired brain controlling our brain and so on. Here, something which uh, till now was just a theoretical point, like you could say, who cares if I'm metaphysically free or not? It's becoming a fact of our political life. Through, again, different ways we are wired, different ways we are controlled and manipulated precisely when we experience ourselves as totally free. Here, although I often don't agree with him, but Yuval Harari, the big bestseller guy, I often don't agree with him, but he nonetheless said something pertinent here. Well, he says, what was till now, till the last decade, an abstract theoretical question, like, you know, you could still enjoy your life, live normally, and then engage in metaphysical debates. I'm not really free. Freedom is my user's illusion. 
But today, no longer with the latest technology, these theoretical dilemmas become practical facts of the reason of my uh, uh, level of my control and so on. And here now we come, if you permit me, to my big metaphysical point. And I think this is freedom at its most radical. Let me go back to, is this the last that you have, the Robert Pippin debate? It was the last one, yes. Yeah, it was yeah, the last yeah, one. Yeah. What Pippin does there, he does it, he's not an idiot. He did it in a very nice, systematic way, and so on. But to cut a long story short, after writing years ago, very good short text on why Hegel can be saved against Heidegger. He now seemed to take Heideggerian position. He, I think, ridiculously misreads Hegel as the thinker of logos. Logos in the sense of total knowability of reality, in the sense that reality is all that can be fully known in a predicative discourse, judgments, and so on. And this self-reflection brought to the end gives us absolute knowing. Nature becomes totally transparent to us, and so on, and so on. Pippin uh, reads this as the culmination of Western metaphysics, whose basic premise is the identity of being and Logos, and he thinks that Heidegger's term in Sein und Zeit and later, I will not go into details, is nonetheless resides in demonstrating, making it clear that there is a dimension of our being human which precedes this level of logical thinking. It is that in order to think, to grasp reality and so on, to us as mortal finite beings, we reality is already disclosed to us in a certain manifestness, which uh, is not predicative logical, but it's part of our, an aspect of our concrete engagement in life world. Now, for reasons, I don't want to take too much of your time, I don't want to go into it now, I don't agree with this. The effort of all of my last books, where I am practically obsessed with the problem of the relationship between transcendental and positive notion of reality, is that when uh, that Heidegger himself, when he speaks about history of being and so on, uh, is from time to time intrigued by the fact, because Heidegger is, by which fact? Heidegger is not a subjective idealist, no? The disclosure of being for us as finite human entities doesn't mean that this disclosure is a divine-like act which creates reality. In a quite naive way, Heidegger and after him people say, of course, out, outside the history of being, the different disclosures of reality, of course, things exist in the world, but they are not beings in the sense of part of our hermeneutic horizon. But I think this is not enough. Heidegger is, for me, the ultimate transcendental thinker, although his notion of transcendentalism is not this Kantian logical. It is that transcendental simply means that whenever we encounter reality, there is always already a hermeneutic horizon, which determines how we perceive reality. But Heidegger himself occasionally said that. For example, when he asks, but how he does this, but how could we emerge out of nature? 
how uh, we need the question prohibited by Pippin in the sense of, but what would have been nature reality outside us? And I think that, that's my idea, that this is the ultimate parallax. Even either you look at reality as all that is and develop in evolutionary psychology or primitive Marxism, how we emerge out of nature through work, whatever, or you remain a transcendentalist and you say, we cannot go behind the horizon of meaning into which we are thrown. This horizon is a beautiful German word, unhintergeber. I think that, to cut it short, that uh, when that Hegel is absolutely not this type of total rationalist, there are many aspects, I will not even lose time, read my books, but uh, I think that what Hegel, sorry that I was so long, but this is my message, what Hegel describes at a couple of levels, as for example, already in his Jena, Real Philosophy, as the, but I don't like the word mystical because it's not mystical, but this experience of what Hegel called using the well-known mystical term, the Nacht der Welt, the night of the world, this radical self annihilating negativity. This is precisely something in between. It is the abyss out of which different horizons emerge. So it's not yet transcendental. It's something much more horrifying. But at the same time, it's no longer nature. Nature, the way external reality. This in-between point, here I think maybe Pippin misunderstood me. This is the gap. And OK, Pippin would have said, but this is just a brief moment, then Hegel mediates in logic this gap. No, I claim he does not. That's why, for example, my eternal other examples, at the beginning of anthropology, part three of uh, philosophy of spirit in his encyclopedia, when Hegel talks about, uh, to put it in primitive terms, how out of natural organisms, human mind emerges, he gives a beautiful, more Foucauldian than Michel Foucault answer, madness. That the origin of being human is madness, animal running ammo, becoming, and then that's the beauty. Hegel doesn't simply sublate Aufhebung this. He said that for us to be human, madness has to remain always in the background as a possibility. And for Hegel, what he calls Persönung, reconciliation, is precisely a reconciliation with this madness, that you will never get rid of it. And as you probably know, in his, in, uh, uh, I developed this, how Hegel was not always Hegelian enough, he doesn't say this when he speaks about sexuality. Well, he is too primitive. He speaks all, as if there is natural copulation, and then with culture, it gets cultivated, you know. Instead of just hitting a woman with a stone and raping her, I write poems, I seduce her. No, Hegel should have known that there is something in between this Tristan and Isolde mortal passion, which is madness. So what culture, cultivation of sexuality cultivates, it's not nature, it's already an unnatural excess. And then I link this with Kant, who says that why is man an animal which needs a master? Because he said, Kant, in contrast to animals, man has a kind of a wild fixation of what term does he use, like wildness, uh, like lawless violence. This is, again, this mid-level. Neither one, nor the, and my weight is that this is the level 
for which Heidegger, for Heidegger doesn't exist. Heidegger ignores this level. He, although he was in communication with the Bernard, uh, uh, whatever, the, the Swiss psychiatrist, Heidegger doesn't enter this domain. He has some mystified uh, hints, for example, when Felderlin went crazy, Heidegger, of course, in a pseudo-poetical way, says he found refuge in the safety of madness and some poetry like that. But, but uh, do you see what I mean here? That this is this is for me also the original this madness zero level of freedom. And then ah, I go a step further and claim that it's not simply that we have natural balance and then human madness, this human madness must be somehow rooted in, under quotation marks, the madness derailment of nature itself. And here enters quantum physics. Now we go on, but I should give you a hint of what is now my, let's call it, we, uh, metaphysical uh, obsession. I'm so sorry, uh, can we interrupt you? Because we have quite a lot of material to cover and very yeah, little yeah, yeah, time. Yeah, so now you will get short will... questions from me, a short answers and so on, yeah. We have, uh, we'll come to uh, to quantum uh, physics yeah, in a bit, but yeah. uh, but what I want to do is, what I want to ask you now is uh, something concerning your conception of politics, which uh, has caused quite some uh, uh, reproaches and, 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 and critiques. One of them is uh, that you uh, constantly change your position in regard to different or concrete or different concrete uh, yeah. situations. Yeah. We can, but we can roughly categorize these reproaches into uh, into three groups. The first one would be uh, the truly violent act do uh, is to do nothing. That is refusal to act. I'm, I'm quoting you here yeah. now. Yeah. Some of the examples would be uh, say not to give money uh, to the banks, not to engage into uh, charity work. Do not buy politically conscious coffee at your local local coffee shop, etc. The second group would be uh, accept the impossible and do all you can. Go all the way. Go to the end. That with that is yeah, like yeah. a revolution, an uprising, yeah. and so on. And then there is the third uh, category, which would be like adopting a more uh, what you call principled, uh, pragmatic posture. Suppose someone who is at least prepared to do something by accepting some of the compromises that accompany the readiness to take over the state uh, power. Say what Aristide did in Haiti and Alvaro Garcia Linera did in, in yeah. uh, Bolivia. But yeah. then there is another uh, thesis that what you have proposed once, I think in the second volume of the idea of communist uh, communism uh, uh, book, a proposal which perhaps remained at the level of a hypothesis. You argued that we need a strong body that is able to make quiz, quick decisions and implement them with all their necessary harshness. So this body is, in your words, a new tetrad, a tetrad of people, movement, party, leader. Can you elaborate shortly uh, on these different options and uh, how they are connected and or con conjuncturally uh, overdetermined? Thanks. Well, my first answer, very friendly. Screw you. You ask a mega complex question, and then I noticed that you added. Can you elaborate shortly? <laughs> no, I will try to. Sorry if this will sound as a strange excuse, but my position is here a Leninist one. Concrete analysis of concrete situation. There are situations, and I follow here our friend Alain Badiou, who said there are situations where, where uh, to be active in doesn't matter how critical way, it's a fake. It strengthens the system. There are situation where, situations where the system is able to reabsorb it. You know, in my violence book, I quote as a wonderful example, uh, that uh, uh, um, uh, Saramago's novel, what was the title? I forget, Blindness. Okay, where simply people decide not to vote and they bring down the entire uh, system. Then there are situations, but it, uh, when again, you have to take the risk and to go all the way through it. 
there definitely are such situations, and I think it's not simply contingent which one do we choose. That's the art of Leninism. You have to do a subtle analysis of a situation, not with not the compromised idea, let's act now when we have a chance to win. No, we never have a chance to win fully, simply. But there are tenses that we, re referring to, I don't know which of you quoted that Beckett, you know, that we have to lose, fail in a productive way, which nonetheless changes the entire field. Then a uh, principle pragmatic uh, posture. Yes, that's what we should do. But we, the, the, but this principle pragmatic posture, I hope we all agree, has a limit. The limit is that the world is so fucked up in such a mess today that it's wrong to think that with this slow, realistic social democracy we will come somewhere. No, as I always repeat, we should get ready for an emergency state. Emergency state will come. And when people said, but you are uh, raising panic and so on, my answer is this cynical reversal. Don't worry, it will come, the emergency state. You know? <laughs> Don't worry, it will come. So, uh, 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 also, this, as you call it, uh, 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 principled pragmatic sense. Here also, one has to be a Leninist in what sense? The art is to choose. Here again, in spite of all my disagreements with him, I agree with Alain, but you, it's very important which particular topic we choose. Often, not it should not be a big principle topic, but something apparently modest. For example, he failed, I know, but for Obama, he was correct to focus on health system, you know. And even with all my critique of Biden now, I have a theory, I will not go into it. Why? He's doing now such catastrophic things apropos Israel. Nonetheless, he detected correctly that today it's important because capital is more organized than ever, especially in these so-called neo-feudal forums. We should fight for new era of syndicates, trade, trade unions, you know. And whatever you say about Biden, when United Auto Workers went on strike, he was the first president in the entire history of the United States who went there, Detroit, I don't know where, and publicly supported the strike of auto workers. So again, with this pragmatic principle pragmatism, it's very important to choose the specific field where you hit something. Of course, the another obvious topic here is uh, 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 ecology and so on. And just one more thing, we should not confuse what you call principled pragmatism with what I call opportunist, uh, principal opportunism. I found this in many pseudo-radical leftists who still advocate some pure revolution, but whenever you have a concrete movement, instead of engaging with it, although you know it will be, it will end in failure, you know, they pretend to stay outside in their safe, usually academic position, and then enjoy the, oh, I told you so, you know, that's why I naively, I hate when people tell me I sit in my academic armchair, sorry, I engage wherever I can. I support Adam, what you are doing, although Alvin Kurt is not a Marxist in the sense of, but at that concrete situation, he plays a positive role, limiting certain nationalism, Russian, you know, it's uh, like, don't be afraid to engage 
concretely. Even if it's a limited struggle, there is always a chance you, uh, that it will lead further. This is a wonderful reproach. Uh, does it, maybe you know better, Frank, is it Marx or Engels who made a wonderful note how concrete public unrest explodes usually in some marginal, like was it in France somewhere where those in power, I even don't know when, 48 or later, raised tremendously the tax on salt. And they said, yes, this is how it works. It's apparently a small element, but if it's the right element, it will explode further. Now, uh, the fourth version, uh, I don't think this is even in to be added to the others. It's just my general point that since we are approaching new catastrophes, the polemic here, my polemic is that since we are approaching new catastrophes, I don't think that the solution will be, you know, as some people, and I read them with pleasure, like David Graeber. I cannot but, uh, 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 but advise you to read his new book on pirates, you know, this pirate republic. It's wonderful, but I don't buy his, generally, his anarchist view. I think that just to confront properly ecological crisis, migrations, and so on, a much stronger coordination, much higher than the level of a single national state will be necessary. And to conclude with a political point, this is why, unfortunately, although it's so fashionable to criticize Europe today, but even the worst Eurocentrists, what they are taking from Europe now, especially those who criticize it, is the worst part of European legacy, strong, fully sovereign nation state. European right-wingers emphasize this. Then, let's take the worst example, Modi, India. She is precisely combining the most brutal capitalism with Hindu nationalism, dismissing others, Muslims as secondary. Even in a way, China can be said, from what I follow there, to be doing this. The reason for this oppression of strengthening of Tibetans and Uyg in Uyghurs is precisely they are already possessed by the European model of strong sovereign nation state. So again, I'm not, when I say strong body, quick decisions, I'm not talking about stronger nation state. I'm even worse here. I'm talking about larger bodies because how can we even think of, of coping properly with ecological crisis without something like this, without much stronger executive, which should be controlled, but at the same time, it should be effective. Let's stop, that's my tragic uh, vision. Let's stop the idea that, that we should trust in the people, people know what is, what they want. For example, I always liked this. Van Hui, my Chinese friend, even tried to convince me. He was sent after Tiananmen for a year or two or before to the countryside. And he tried to convince me that how? Living with ordinary farmers, he learned something, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, why not? But I don't think the ordinary farmers in the countryside possess some deeper wisdom. I'm here a universalist. Wisdom can, wisdom in the sense of proper historical insight can emerge here or there or anywhere. I don't believe in privileged historical subjects. Here, a very friendly reproach to our good friend, uh, Alain Badiou. Didn't he use the term of, uh, what was his term? Homeless immigrant proletarians or what? Nomadic, nomadic proletarians. Nomadic. Now, the idea is beautiful one. They are nomadic. They don't even have a home. So they fit perfectly this 
Marxian definition. I'm more of a pessimist. As experience has taught us, they may be without change in the sense of uh, limited to some uh, uh, patriotic ideology, but they usually precisely to act, counteract this material homelessness, they are all the more transfixed on their traditional ideological change, religious and so on. So I'm not against them. No, I'm just saying do not uh, privilege them. Okay. I stopped okay. so that wonderful. So can we can we uh, jump ahead a little and shift gear a little bit because we would like to discuss ah, Lenin, but we can do it briefly about this your uh, Lenin your uh, uh, your Lenin's point you know or uh, okay you run the show I'm sorry <laughs> no no I just we we so I thought we could jump ahead a bit and um, talk about uh, your engagement with quantum physics that's uh, question seven in in the questions and in the sense i think that it touches upon what you already raised in your um in in taking up our conversation with robert pippin because it appears um to us that that quantum physics for you brings um the domain or realm of appearance to its very constitutive limits or formalizes the very constitutive limits in such a way that it sort of confronts us with the very inconsistent structure that is constitutive for appearance as appearance i mean if we can put it in this hegelian uh, hegelian jargon Put differently, I mean, um, because it is still physics, right? It's not simply mathematics. So we move through appearance to somewhere where we attain an access to the, let's say, incoherent or inconsistent ontology yeah. of appearance itself, if 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 we understand correctly. So in some sense, we're ta talking about the very the very the very um, um, constitutional sphere um, that makes whatever being into what it is, whatever appearance into what it is. But that sphere itself, and that seems to be, let's say, the ontological twist of quantum physics, is not stable. Is not simply one form. Is not simply not even a stable form of contradiction or a stable form of law of principles. Right. As as I don't know, for example, in in Stalinist classical, as you pointed out uh, in, in, in many of your books, um, in the old Stalinist dialectic materialist universe, where there were just stable laws and principles that that accounted for transformation and, and the constitution of reality. But rather, quantum physics presents us, if, if we understand correctly, with a contradiction or with an inconsistency in the very discourse of science itself. And that inconsistency sort of is, let's say, um, um, mappable onto or corresponds, um, one could say, as Hegel says, Entsprechung, to an inconsistency in reality itself. So, right? I mean, yeah. Um, and so, 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 so is that, would you agree with that rendering? Is that why di a dialectical materialist position needs to engage with quantum physics? Because it moves from, from appearance to exactly that kind of level. Yeah, yeah, perfect question. I will try again not to, <laughs> or I'm almost cynically tempted to say, why don't you two guys go to sleep and allow me to go on for a while, for one hour? <laughs> I awaken you. No, perfect question. Let me clarify things. Uh, uh, first, do you know that you, Frank, gave me an idea for many things that I write about quantum physics when didn't you publish even a book, Old Denial, I forget titles, with something like, was it materialism without matter or what? No, what idealism was without <clears throat> idealism. Uh, idealism without idealism, and the other side of that is materialism without matter, yes. Yeah, because I think this is, for me, the big achievement of quantum physics. It begins with Einstein, but it doesn't go far enough. Because let's Still, let's face it, still modern physics, Einstein and then quantum physics, the, I simplified, but the basic intuitive approach to reality was it's empty space and some small balls jumping up and down there. And then these balls keep it harder, combined, blah, blah, blah. But uh, so this is why this traditional materialist always felt threatened when you speak about waves. Ah, oh, no matter, are you, are you approaching uh, uh, idealism? And unfortunately, 
that's why we have to fight here, not simply accept quantum physics. I trust quantum physicists as such, but do you know that many of them, even the guy who is not an idiot, uh, uh, Zeilinger, one of the three who got the last year Nobel Prize, oh my God, I liked so much what he was saying, but then he ruined almost everything by saying, you know, I'm a personal friend of Dalai Lama, and he taught me that uh, there is maybe another spiritual dimension, you know. Because the problem is that many quantum physicists interpret this wonderful result. For example, it's now proven. That's why they got the Nobel Prize, the three guys last year. It's proven what quantum physics only speculated about that if you know that you if you split to uh, an entity into two correlative parts neutron positive whatever and then you change one they are correlative if one is negative the other one is positive you if you do something to the first part the second part will move in a predictable way. If I push down here, it's up there. But the enigma is how can this happen when it happens faster than the speed of light? Because for Einstein, the speed of light is the ultimate limit of movement in our material universe, sorry, of speed. Uh, nothing can move faster. Here, obviously, the information from one subparticle to another got faster. Now, as we all know, Einstein's answer was there must be some hidden variables. They proved that it's not this. But now, instead of saying, okay, and this is the top of quantum physics speculation today, it is that uh, <laughs> our spatiotemporal reality is not the ultimate horizon of being. There are others, at least one, this quantum wave level of reality, which, again, in which space and time do not function in the same way. But again, the problem is that there are already now some Hindu obscurantists or other entering the stage and saying, ah, you see, this is the spiritual dimension. In materiality, of course, it's Material reality is the speed of life. No, 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 but spiritually we are in instant uh, contact and so on. Here, in, but I believe, you see how I return to the old-fashioned Althusserian topic of uh, struggle between materialism and idealism in science? Here we have it. Uh, and uh, I would like to draw your attention to a book from, uh, I briefly met him, a Dutch guy called Thomas Hertog. He wrote a book uh, uh, which is pretty good on the origin of time, something like this. He was, in the last years of Stephen Hawking's life, his friend and secretary, and they were developing a wonderful new theory. Now, I cannot judge, are these pure speculations and so on, that, uh, that uh, it's not as simple as people thought. You have a big bank, although it goes to Stephen Hawking's materialist credentials that he opposed the notion of big bank as the absolute beginning. This is too idealist because then theologists enter. Ah, what was the big bank? Ah, big bank is the point of interest. No, but his idea is a wonderful one that. And he tries to prove it scientifically. I don't know if it's true, but as they say, it's a non vero e ben trovato. <laughs> that uh, in this primordial chaos, after, immediately after the big bang, and this goes nicely to what you, Frank, said about uh, 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 eternal natural laws and so on. No. That there was, it's a very risky short circuit, but he, David Hertog, linking Big Bang to Darwin. By Darwin, I mean 
struggle, competition, survival of the fittest. Isn't it a wonderful idea that in the ultra primordial universe, there were different natural laws competing? It was our universe with its natural laws. It was a different world, maybe without time, just space. It was an opposite one. And that isn't it a wonderful idea how our natural laws are not simply eternal. They, in our universe, contingently emerge through some, of course, not conscious, spontaneous Darwinian struggle. I love these speculations. Now I'm reading the book, and what I'm trying to do, obviously, because this is not my scientific domain, I am now desperately reaching my friends around among quantum scientists to ask them a simple question. Are these guys taken seriously or not? You know, is this? But uh, you see how nice is this when we speculate about, we write books about contingent necessity, the contingent origins of a necessity, but it happens here. So this would be my ultimate, I mean, a scientific debate. So my ultimate madness would be here to speculate that in the abyss of human freedom, what I described as uh, totally self-destructive uh, 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 night of the world, it is as if the ultra-repressed primordial aspect of nature, that chaos, you know, without even loss of nature being established, is coming back, is returning. These are my mega speculations. I know they are problematic, but in my old age, when whenever I look around myself, I see only sheep, sheep in Ukraine, Russia, sheep in Gaza, you know, not to mention other things. I deeply, uh, I'm sorry we don't have time to go in, but in one of the questions where you have to sleep about war today, no, I deeply agree with, uh, uh, it was your, Frank, I see here, point, that, you know, war is not simply war. We have even more cruel wars than the ones that we talk about. But because of the global context political situation, some wars are, are perceived as a threat to global peace, and some are treated as localized events. Now, it's not so difficult to understand, but one has to understand it. Why Ukraine, Russia is perceived because of NATO, the East, blah, 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 as this, or why the Israeli Gaza war is perceived as such. So uh, I agree with you that one should, uh, you see, always be aware, I cannot but call it of a global political constellation. It's never, that's why I got in trouble in my talk in uh, Frankfurt when I mentioned context. And I was immediately good, oh, you are justifying Hamas. No, this is madness. Books were written, correct books, about the context, the historical situation which gave rise to Hitler. You don't relativize. Hitler is still e ultra evil, blah, blah. And this doesn't justify Hitler. But Hitler was able to emerge only against the background of the situation, crisis of the 20s. And it's crucial to measure the impact of wars. When are they perceived as global threat or no in this way? You know, otherwise we, otherwise we either relativize everything or we simply essentialize. No, you are right to point out, for example, in Central Africa, Burkina Faso, and so on. It's, this is, I think, the true tragedy of the West. France was, as we see it clearly now, really keeping the central western part of Western Africa in neo-colonial subordination. And since there was no progressive alternative, we get now ISIS or whoever, and even Russians, Wagner Group. So again, uh, 
Can I, because can I interrupt you? Immediately, oh. just my yeah. position is here double, if you agree. At the same time, we should take into account global context, but what we should not do is to demand of local people who are caught in war to sacrifice their struggle for freedom on behalf of global interest. For example, you remember, it's just south of your place, Aragon. You remember when Greece and Macedonia made that compromise? Yeah. Even many of my leftist friends said, oh, they played the game of NATO, the point was then to include. Yeah, but what should we say to Macedonians? No, you should insist in this crisis and get co even caught in a war not to serve NATO or whatever. Fuck you, oh, offer them a better solution. You know, that's the balance. Take into account the global situation, but do not repeat the old mistake even in communist movement when in tradi its traditional forum, it was, yeah, yeah, women's rights, but don't push it too far. After the revolution, it will be done. You know. Sorry, I finished. Yeah, well, we would like to move to a slightly different uh, area or domain, in part also because uh, this post podcast is called Philosophy and its uh, and its other uh, other scene. You are one of the very few uh, philosoph uh, uh, philosophical thinkers who actually use the uh, medium of film, and we do not mean uh, documentaries, as a medium for thought and uh, analysis. We are obviously here thinking of uh, the two already existing perverts guides to cinema uh, yeah, ideology yeah. films that you have uh, done in collaboration uh, with Sophie Fines. Uh, what does it mean for you to present your thought in a form of uh, art that you describe yourself as a perverse, also as the ultimate uh, uh, pervert art? Why is it crucial to present thought, to articulate thought in a pervert artistic uh, artistic medium? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a very interesting question. You know why? Because uh, what I will say now, I will just report on my uh, experience. I didn't first have an idea, why do I need movies, and then start to analyze them. It began with enjoying the movies. So, a brief answer. First, uh, let me be frankly self-critical. Uh, I think that more than half of what I write about movies is I purely exploit movies as an example to illustrate some theoretical point. Then there is about 25-30% where I do an analysis of a movie, but more just to analyze an ideological phenomenon. I don't dwell specifically with the movie. So only rarely, but I hope sometimes I do something more, which is I effectively analyze a movie. By this, I mean I analyze its form in the sense that, as all good Marxists know, beginning with Fred Jensen's Marxism and Forum, a true Marxist is always a formalist in the sense of uh, the form in a great work of art not only perfectly renders content, but even contradicts content. It tells more than content. It can go even against the explicit intention of its author. And this is what I think I do in my, let's call them, I'm ashamed to say this, best analysis. I have here a couple of examples. I did some, I will not go to the standard stuff, but okay, just with Hitchcock. I think that the proper way, and Jensen agrees here with me, to read Hitchcock is not to begin with anxiety, death, guilt, murder, and then, but to see the content of his films and it's clear if you read Hitchcock's conversations with François Truffaut, he says this. He said it all begins with a certain scene, camera movement, and so on. What if camera moves like this, like that? And 
And then he invents the story to be able to use the formal procedures. So at my best, when I analyze Hitchcock, is I focus on some purely formal motives, like the one that I detect from his uh, murder from uh, 31 or 2, or when one of his early sound movies, to psycho uh, uh, birth and so on. This idea of how camera approaches an uncanny object, and then all of a sudden it jumps up, you get this God's view, what Hitchcock called, and then all of a sudden some obscene agent, which is like an evil god, intervenes into reality. Let me understand, but what I'm saying is that we get here a certain, inscribed into the forum itself, a certain terrifying theology of evil god, which runs even against the usual reading of the film, the intention, and so on and so on. And to go uh, further, that's why, as many of my readers know, the ultimate maybe movie of the last half a century is maybe, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, for me, uh, Robert Altman's shortcuts. Because, you know, vulgar leftists read it, you know, it eight, nine parallel stories about ordinary people in these depressive suburbs of Los Angeles, contingent encounters among them. They read it as a portrayal of the despair, spiritual void, hopelessness of middle classes. No, where is, there is an optimist dimension in the forum itself. These contingent encounters, some are bad, some are good, you know, it's a kind of a almost Belarusian pluralistic universe. At the level of forum, without presenting any positive hero, at the level of forum, uh, Altman renders the positive counterpart, the optimistic uh, uh, dimension. And again, what I'm really obsessed with is uh, how Sometimes today, I will make a jump to literature, even if we are dealing with a traditional genre, but the forum can change its status, make it a true work of art. My example that I like to quote lately is, you know, Tana French, the new Irish lady detect her excellent stories. What does she do? He offers, at the level of content, the best class analysis of antagonisms of today's Ireland. But you cannot say, why does she still follow the detective uh, novel form? Wouldn't it be better to directly do it? No, it would have been vulgar to direct. You know, that's the beauty that through this detour, through the forum, of the forum of detective novel, which has imminently nothing to do with antagonism of today's Ireland, is a way to depict this antagonism much more accurately than through some direct realist analysis, which is, I'm even ready to go so far. Traditional realist writing is either lost in some postmodern metafiction or bullshit, but I think that today I'm going to the end. And it's important to know that all these new writers, Gillian Flynn and so on in the United States, they are women. The new, they call it feminine noir. That their police procedures and these are detective novels superficially, they still follow the formula who done it, like at the end you learn the truth, but this is, I think, the only authentic genre where literature novels are really a work of art. I think that novels, I am already tempted to generalize this. Novels, which want to be directly works of art, are fake bullshit. Maybe it goes a little bit also for science fiction, but my privileged domain today are detective novels written by women. And so that I will at least appear as a good feminist, 
I would like to say that the same goes, and this is the problem for us who are all of three, okay, not all, old, I am an old white man. Isn't it that also so many good books about Hegel are today written by women? So at least here, I'm not saying this as a cheap feminist promote women. No, I envy them. I hate them. They can be better than me, you know. But uh, I like it that good books on Hegel and good detective novels are today written by women. Sorry. <laughs> It's, okay, well, well, I, I like your books on Hegel as well, I must say. I think they're quite okay. Uh, so you're not doing too badly. Become, you will become a woman. Okay, but that's enough. <laughs> um, so let's jump to the very end. We usually end the podcast with a series of either or questions. Okay. And you can elaborate on your choice, but you don't have to. And some are sillier than others. Um, uh, so this reminds me of your standard joke, no? I can elaborate, but you don't have to, which is, you know, my old joke. Can I pay for dinner? No, can I? And you know exactly. that I will pay, but yeah. Okay, let's go on. Exactly. exactly. So let's yeah. let's begin with the first one. Drive or drive? You know, for a long time, I was tempted by drive. As if drive is more substantial. No. Now I think that desire is the desire for something and drive are both two versions to isolate a certain more substantial gap, which would be desire for nothing. Desire for a piece, purely self-destructive desire. So it would be desire, but a qualified desire. Uh -huh. Okay, Freud or Lacan? With all my mega love for Freud, I would say Lacan, because I nonetheless read previous authors, Freud, Hegel, through Lacan. So I would say Lacan. So even if it is Freud, it's Freud through Lacan. Okay. Wagner or Beethoven? This will point you. I'm sorry. Beethoven, I love no, Wagner. I think <laughs> Wagner precisely because if there ever was a disgusting, sleazy guy, it's him. But my God, what he does in his music is so breathtaking and like the greatest celebration of a tragic Jewish figure, you find it in Wagner. Although he was stupidly anti-Semitic as a person. But look, who is the hero of, main hero of all Wagner's operas, from Fliegen the Hollander to, to uh, Amfortas in Parsifal? is the figure of a wandering Jew. A hero wounded who wants to die but cannot die. And Wagner says, this is, uh, he says, Pligen and Hollander is Achaswer, uh, wandering Jew. So you see, you get that art at its greatest. You get in, in the work of art, the artist himself defeats himself, his private bullshit. The French Revolution or the Russian Revolution? I'm sorry, here I will uh, disappoint you, French. Because the Russian Revolution, although Lenin was the greatest improviser, you know. And this is, isn't this admitted, a beautiful paradox that Lenin, who is considered half dialectical materialist, I mean, uh, necessity and so on, no, and at the same time, people, idiots, usually take, uh, uh, take, uh, 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 take, uh, take, uh, uh, Hegel as, uh, uh, take Hegel as uh, this absolute necessity. What Lenin learned from Hegel is precisely contingency. How even if it doesn't fit Marxist dogma, you can do a revolution in there where it wasn't even imaginable to do it and so on. But, but nonetheless, Lenin remained too much uh, philosophical determinist. What I like in St. Just and uh, Robespierre is that wonderful, you know, when I don't know who, I think St. Just says that revolutionary is like a captain of a boat in wild sea without compass who just has to improvise. So French Revolution. Okay, Schumann, Robert or Clara? I'm sorry to disappoint feminists, but here I'm for Robert. Because you know, it's often today in our city feminist times, the temptation to say behind a successful man, there may be a woman. 
what I usually say provocatively is, okay, then, then let's rehabilitate Elizabeth first of Nietzsche, <laughs> the true source of Nietzsche. But you know, no, Cla I understand Clara because of private reasons. She had, you know, Schumann was comfortably composing and, and uh, uh, spending money, blah, blah. But Clara had to take care of money household. So no wonder that she was putting pressure at him, at Robert. Don't do that bullshit about your, uh, your small piano pieces. Do orchestral stuff, concerts. It will bring us more money and so on. So no, nonetheless, unfortunately here it's Robert. Okay, Marx, Carlo, or the brothers? This may be a bad surprise for you. Still, Carl. Because it quite surprised me. I read some biographies. You know, don't idealize Marx's brother. Mm. Uh, 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 Groucho himself was pretty much anti-communist and so on and so on. Don't idealize them. So, yes, they are nice and so on. Although recently I tried to see again some of their mega hits like that soup mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work so much i don't okay i'll put it like this marx i have my critical point but marx is eternal in the sense that every epoch can reinvent him you always found existentialists found something in marx altisser did hegelian i unfortunately doubt that marx brothers are at the level of Ernst Lubitsch or those mega great who can be reinvented at each epoch. François Truffaut or Alfred Hitchcock? Why should even be a, a choice here? <laughs> Hitchcock. I respect Truffaut, some good movies, but too much of a simple opportunity doesn't care. Okay, I'll put it like this. The greatest thing that Truffaut is is did is his book on conversation with Hitchcock better than all the movies. <laughs> um, the early Marx or the early Lacan? Definitely early Lacan, because early Marx, not just all those ma philosophical manuscripts, but also German ideology and so on. I think if you look for the theoretical, Sources, options, possibilities for Stalinism, you find them in early Marx. I never, although when I was young, it was this young, it was this uh, uh, obsession with oh, alienation, early Marx, and so on. No, no, no. While early Lacan, she, it's not simple line from imaginary, symbolic, real. She often, if you retroactively read early Lacan, you find wonders there. Mm. The late Marx or late Lacan? Here, if on one condition, if by late Lacan, you don't mean just from 70s on, but really the conclusion last year, yeah. I would say late Marx. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I talked with my friend Mlad and Dolar about this, maybe even with you, and we came to the result that Lacan reaches his top at between Seminar 11 and then till Encore, uh, uh, Logic of Fantasy, and so on. But the very last years when he goes into this uh, 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 knots and all that stuff, he is following a wrong path. And this is why the most tragic text of Lake Lacan for me is his, just a couple of sentences, his very last seminar, which is really a suicidal note where he said, I failed. So I would say late Marx. OK, uh, silly one, burger or hot dog? What about Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg? Oh, oh I, I jumped ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Lenin or Rosa Lenin, Luxemburg? Lenin, Lenin. I never, and I was never tempted to idealize Rosa Luxemburg. First, she wasn't even so soft and humanist as they claimed. Do you know that I read in a letter of the guy who is supposed to be the toughest, Felix Dzerzhinsky, the founder of Czech. You know that he wrote in one of his letters that he was too tough for him, that he was afraid of Rosa Luxemburg. No, I think Rosa Luxemburg left this in good sense, not opportunism, but pragmatic, how to combine principled stance with extreme, in good sense, 
pragmatic plasticity, use the unique opportunity, and so on. So on with Rosa Luxemburg. Okay, a silly one, burger or hot dog? Sorry, which is the first one? Uh, the uh, burger or hot dog? Burger, burger. Okay. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, because uh, because uh, 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 hot dog, there is something, oh my God, I will now show my personal side. Eating hot dog is too close to fellatio to me, and I don't like eating things. <laughs> my, my favorite is, my God, what I'm saying, double cheeseburger. Whenever I eat it, I'm tempted to eat two, three of them, which is not good for me. One last one. Money or life? Money. Fuck life. <laughs> because you know why? Because it's a hypocritical question. Because if I, if I were to say life, it would be, yeah, life is nonetheless more basic. But what is life without money? You know, I hate people who say money is not everything. Yes, you can say this when you have enough money. You know. No, no, no. I, uh, I think that money here stands for all good things for new options, uh, uh, some kind of a freedom, you know. For example, I and I would need money for this. You know, I asked myself, frankly, if friends would not be problem. They are everywhere and people who I love. Where I would like to live? In a big city, in a really expensive hotel, and they some of them, they also have special entrance for permanent guests like a noble two three rooms you know why because there it's the permanent so they do when you want laundry uh, uh the bed you have room service all the time but at the same time you have a place of your own but at the same time you are alone okay i know such a room costs twenty thousand per month minimum but that is my idea of happiness. You are all the time free to do nothing, to sleep, and to work all the time. So it's money. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Slavoj. Thank uh, you, and I really appreciate so both much. of you. I hope we will finally meet at some point, you know, because there is not enough I'm not gay, but I will say so there is not enough physical contact. <laughs> <laughs>